Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Understanding the Enneagram. Do you know what your core fear is? Your underlying motivation? Do you know how to change? Do you want to be the best version of yourself? Today we're going to find the answers to these questions. When looking at personality tools, the Myers-Briggs type indicator shows you who you are from the outside inwards. It shows us that each of us have a different way of gaining energy, taking in information, making decisions and approaching life. The MBTI helps us gain our insights into our own psychological type preferences, which can help us understand the natural differences amongst people. Understanding your preferences and the preferences of others can be beneficial for you in work, family life and play. It will enable you to approach your co-workers, family and friends in a way that suits your style while accommodating others' styles. Temperament's another tool that helps us understand ourselves and others. Our temperaments are the combination of mental, physical and emotional traits of a person, and natural predisposition. Temperament talks about people's behaviours and offers a framework for understanding why people behave as they do. By identifying a person's dominant temperament, you can gain insight into their natural tendencies, strengths, weaknesses and how they're likely to react in various situations. This can help you communicate more effectively with them. Today we're looking at the Enneagram, another personality tool that will help to fill the gaps in that personality puzzle. The Enneagram looks at you from the inside out and is the essence of who you are in your healthiest form. If you're listening, then you'll probably love learning about more of yourself. I'm Kate Mason and welcome to Parenting and Personalities. This is the podcast that connects you to the ones that you care about the most. Today I'm going to be talking to the wonderful Jackie Coburn about the framework of the nine types of the Enneagram. The Enneagram is an incredibly in-depth tool for discovering more about yourself and your relationships with others. Jackie is a heart-centered giver with a remarkable sense of purpose. She's a triple certified coach, life coach, NLP coach and Enneagram coach who helps people reach goals through increased self-awareness and emotional intelligence. Her down-to-earth approach provides a safe space for the reformer, the giver, the achiever, the individualist, the observer, the guardian, the enthusiast, the challenger, and the peacemaker to take their places at the table, whatever that means for them. She's an obsessive learner and avid question asker who firmly believes everybody's personality is dying to shine through and dominate the world. They just need to be asked the right question. Hi, Jackie. It's great to have you with us today. Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. You seem like a lot of fun. (laughs) (laughs) I like to think so. Um, Look, I'm really excited to learn about what you're going to tell us about today because I was listening to you on another podcast and I thought, oh my goodness, this is something that I've actually never touched on Enneagrams because on my Enneagram, I am actually the person that flicks from thing to thing. And when I was doing my temperament and my type, I realized that if I took something else on, I was just going to be so excited about everything. I was never going to concentrate on anything because I actually know myself quite well. So I've actually never looked at it. And when I heard you talking, I was just like, time to look at it because it mentions things that are not in the Myers-Briggs type indicator or in temperament. There's so much more to our personalities anyway. So what I want to know is how did you get started? Like what drove this passion and where did it all come from? Oh my God. Is it morbid if I start with self-hatred? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, no, I think, I don't, no, I think that's actually probably what a lot of people have got. So here's the, here's the thing that I realized through a series of events, which I'll go into, that I was showing up empty. And what that means is when I was quote unquote showing up in life, in love, in work, in my job, in my passions, I was showing up empty, which meant that I was either trying to respond to my environment and be that person, 
or uh, I was just trying my best, but I didn't know how to show up. So while I didn't quite know it at the time, that is what was happening through the trajectory of my life because I, like many people, was stuck in fight or flight mode, but I didn't quite know what was driving it, right? We all have something that's motivating us, but we don't, we're hiding it even from ourselves. And so I graduated college and I was bright eyed and bushy tailed and super excited. I was working with survivors of trafficking and I, I was like, wow, I like love working with these women. I love working with these people and um, got headhunted to work at a nonprofit and as it is at a nonprofit, you really have to know yourself. That's my opinion because you are doing seven, eight roles, sometimes for the price of one um, and sometimes under not so rigorous corporate environments. And so that, that could be a little bit uh, difficult. I burnt out. I didn't know myself, couldn't speak up for myself, couldn't say a single thing about it, couldn't tell you why I was doing this, couldn't tell you why I was feeling a certain way. And I realized I didn't understand anybody and I realized I didn't understand myself. And it, I just was like, I have to take a step back. I have to take a step back. Someone was like, oh, have you ever heard of like personality typing? There's this thing called like Enneagram. And I was like, eh, okay. <laughs> I, re- I, I took an online test, didn't resonate. Took another one, didn't resonate. I was like, all right, whatever. Eventually, I pick up a book and I start reading about how when you do something out loud, it doesn't mean quite as much as why you're doing it. And I was like, oh, interesting. Then I read about my type and I put that literature down and I didn't pick it up for six months because I was so embarrassed. I was like, this person has been stalking me. They know about my life. They know why I do things. I didn't even tell myself this. How did you know? <laughs> and so essentially, essentially, rock bottom was a teacher that I utilized. But my first step is something that I think a lot of people miss, which was I just took it all inward. Um, and I don't mean I internalized it. I don't mean I shoved it down. I mean, I took it inward and I said like, Okay, the whole the whole the whole word of wisdom is you can't control anything except yourself. So let me start there. And that was it for me, honestly. It was getting into that study saying I needed to take control of my life. I was sick of being assaulted by questions I couldn't answer. Like, what am I here for? And is this it? Is there more? Um I was like, yeah, I'm taking this into my own hands. And I'm so glad I did. Mm-hmm. And did it give you all those answers? It is giving me those answers and it is also having me stop uh, asking myself different questions like am I safe here like for me for my personality type which we'll go into a little bit but um, one of those resounding questions is like am I loved here or am I just tolerated those questions I have my moments and I'll be managing my core fears for the rest of my life as all of us will but right but that those moments are far and few in between. And I, I will tell you, as a recovering people pleaser, it's a freaking joke when somebody tries to tell me about me now. You know what I mean? And so it's it's one of those things where like we are all going to be learning well into our 120th year on this earth. And I wanted to learn and live based on me. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Nor do I. And I think that's, I, I agree with you. I think finding out about yourself is the hugest step. Well, it's the first step. And if you don't know and understand yourself, how are you going to make other people happy if you're not happy in who you are anyway? So that's that's great, uh, such great knowledge. And how young were you when you learned all of this? I started looking into the Enneagram shortly after college, so maybe 21. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been studying it for almost 10 years, mm-hmm. but I've been using it in coaching for about five. Yeah. And so did that, that when did you start coaching with it then? What what drove that desire? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you were you were twenty five. Right yes, I was I was twenty five, twenty four, something like that. Um, and it, it was funny because I, throughout my life, if someone was like, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" I had no concept. I had literally no concept of what I was good at, even. Um, but I would always rec- like to my recollection, I would always just say the m- most recent career I could think of that had an impact. So like one day I wanted to be a writer, next day I wanted to be a mom, I wanted to be a nurse, I wanted to be a teacher, and. Um, I was working in finance, God bless my soul, and um, I was, because I was helping people, but um, I was working in finance and then in a, like a massive, this was like, it had to be like a moment, right? And a shift in the universe, got laid off with like 40 other people. And that was the moment that I was like, I've been telling myself I need to help people and I'm sitting on this for way too long. I just got to do it. 
by the end of the weekend, it was like a Friday, I got laid off. By the end of the weekend, I had a website up and running. And by Monday, I was so resolved that when my manager called me and said like, oh, we're bringing a few people back. I was like, yeah, no, I'm not coming back. And that was it. And to this day, you know, he messaged me on Instagram like a, a like a few weeks ago and was like, I can't believe you're still doing this. And I was like, I can't believe you're still at that company. So, <laughs> but um, but that's what it was. Yeah. It was one of those things where it's I, I am so grateful that I had those tools at the time because normally I would have resolved to not do something for myself because it would have felt selfish and wrong, uh, even if it meant helping people in the long wrong long run. It would have still been for me. Um, and so the reason I use the Enneagram as a basis for coaching is uh, a few things. One, For one, we don't always um, we don't always know if there's a step zero before our goal, right? That we don't, we aren't quite aware of. We're not really sure what we're competing against. Um, the other thing is that sometimes when we hear about our core motivations, our fears, we can start connecting dots in a way that goes, oh my God, I thought this was my goal, but I don't think it is. I think my goal is actually uh, W over there, you know? Um, and the other the other thing is, is some people, I'll give you an example. The other day I had a consultation and the person told me two things. I started a business and I'm having a hard time um, managing my time as like a mom, a wife, and a business owner. And also I want to learn how to do well with the money that I'm making. So her personality type takes a huge toll into this because I don't know, if I'm lucky we get what, three months together? You've got the whole rest of your life without me. And so what we do is we use the things that we know about ourselves, the tendencies, where we know we go, how we know we get when we're stressed, things like that to create those plans for sustainability. Because the only thing that's not changing in this life is how you are. Mm. That's like, that's, that's the only thing, maybe what you do, but not how you are. And um, so we use, I use the Enneagram to help people use themselves as the framework for their lives instead of going with the flow and trying to figure it out. What a great way of looking at it because we do need framework. And like you say, once you um, work a job you love, you never really work a day in your life. So, yeah. you know, if you're enjoying <laughs> Spoken what, like a real seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love life. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the truth of it, you know. Um, and and so I was just wondering because you're such a young person, you know, coaching um, – Often, uh, you know, when we get older, we ha- we kind of do stuff like that. But you have so much wisdom in such a young person too to be doing that. You know, I I think that's amazing um, in itself. You know, I look at my kids, and I don't think they would have been ready for this type of thing at that early age. So it's early age because I'm 61. Um, so t- we're going to go through the enneagram today, and you're just going to give me a brief rundown of each of them, just to start with. How did where did this tool come from? Like, and what's the essence of it? And I just want to talk about the MBTI. You mentioned the MBTI uh, in one of your podcasts. It's looking at yourself from the outside in because it's externally that we're looking at ourselves in the MBTI. Whereas the Enneagram, Enneagram's looking at you from the inside out. Um, so if you can just tell tell us how that all works. I appreciate that you used the word essence. And the reason I say that is because one of my favorite things to say is, okay, it's a person 101 it's a personality typing tool done period uh 102 is your personality is a coping mechanism but we'll get there um but the truth of the matter is is it's not really about personality because personality is a coping mechanism and also personality is really only characterized by what we do out loud and how we can be described so what the enneagram does in a large scale yeah in a small scale yeah it's a personality but on a larger scale it's your essence essentially what it does is it it gives you you on on a platter in two different forms who you are and who you meant who you're meant to be mm-hmm. and goes okay there's a weird crumbly bridge right in between and here's how you get there here you go and it's it's a weird journey so that's essentially what the enneagram is it's it's it predates Myers Briggs and those studies like Carl Jung things like that by a couple of thousand years at least um, an oral tradition in the Middle East moved its way to South America and moved its way up so it's been around for a long time as a, a person of Middle Eastern descent it's something that like you know oral storytelling orally describing motivations and like that's very ingrained in our culture so mm. it came very easy to me um, and uh, but essentially it's one of those things that says, okay, like it, it, it also has a heartbeat in psychology because I, I love talking to my therapist about it yeah. because I'll be like, you know, but like, isn't it true that someone with this core fear might have the tendency to do X, Y, and Z? And she'll be like, well, 
yeah, that's actually, what is it called? Reaction formation. I'm like, I knew it. I knew it was psychologically sound. You know, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's been around forever and everything in psychology has been around forever it also. It just hasn't been on paper. That's so, right. you know. They're just learning it at uni <laughs> rather than learning it through life. Yes. Yeah. Yes, mm. exactly. Exactly. So um, essentially it's a roadmap to your essence. Um, and it's, it's a nice little, uh, it gives you those rumble strips in a sense where, oh, I didn't know I was veering, but now I can stay in my lane kind of thing. Because there are things that once you know, you only do them when you feel X, Y, and Z. You can't unknow that. You know what I mean? Yes. Yep. You can pick it. Yeah. 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 Great. So I can go through the nine times. Yes. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. So take a deep breath. Um, so the type one is typically nicknamed the perfectionist or the reformer. That for me depends on the subtype. So uh, I, I love them. I feel that like they like to reform everything as they go. They find things that stand out to them and go, ah, this needs my touch. This needs my fixing. This needs my words. This needs me. Um, their core fear, a lot of people say that their core fear is being bad or evil. But when I work with clients over and over, one thing that I find is that their core fear is actually that they are unable to change, that they would be unable to grow, that they're essentially immutable. And so they'll, they'll spend their whole lives escaping from that. The uh, type two is called the helper or the giver. And they are warm, interpersonal, like they they are geared to help and meet the needs of others. I think using both the helper and the giver uh, is really important because, again, based on the subtypes, you'll see I give a couple of nicknames for each type. Um, I myself, as a sexual two um, or an intimate two, I don't identify with the helper. I identify with the giver, which is worse. Just kidding. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So you give lots. Yeah. Get, give lots. Well, so it, one of them is uh, is helping through action as a means to gain love, right? And that's the the fear of the type two is not only are they not loved, but they're not lovable. And so their actions will secure that spot for them or the giving of themselves completely. Type three is called the performer or the achiever. And they are charming, dressed to kill, like killing it. CEOs, like they are some of the top of, the, they're the top brass people. Um However, for them, they don't really quite know where their achievements end and where they begin. Um, and their core fear is that they're only worth just as much as their works. And so if I um, I didn't type this person, but that consultation I was talking to you about earlier, if you think about somebody who's like, I, I need to balance time between being a mom, being a wife, and being a business owner, and let's say they were a type three, there's a lot to unpack there, right? Because what's my worth in? The type four is called the individualist or uh, some people nickname the tortured artist. I don't have a second nickname for the type four. I don't like the tortured artist. It sounds too much like John Mayer to me. It does Um, and it creates an image in your head immediately. Like like when I look at that, I think... I don't want to be that. I wouldn't want to be that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Spoken like a sub- So mm. it's funny because there's one of the subtypes of the type four that often comes off as seven, uh, which is very, very interesting. So, but the, uh, the four is called the individualist and they are incredibly highly creative. Um, they have a large capacity to feel, period. Some people have emotions and do emotions. They are emotions and they feel it and they have a right they feel a right and an obligation to feel those throughout the day and um, for them they are going through life signify um, trying to find significance that bounces off this belief that if they're really really special they'll have to stand out if they're really going to make it in this world if they're really going to leave their fingerprint and leave something significant behind they're going to have to stand out and be special and so their whole life's work is to being individual and to being special Type five is the observer or the theorist. I think the theorist is so fitting there, but the observer is like really nine times out of 10, their behavior on the outside. Um, They are 100% cerebral. Like they're usually all the way up there, up in their heads. Um, They are those people who are collecting information. They're like some of the best people to call if you're comparing like computer models, car models, things like that. They're very highly cerebral. They're going to give you the facts. Um, and for them, their core fear is actually double sided, but one and the same. On one hand, they work really hard to um, gather all of the information that they need for life and the world. On the other hand, they work hard to not be depleted of their energy and to be kind of obsolete into nothing and non existent. And the way that they go hand in hand is well, knowledge and facts take up less energy than feelings. And so that is my preparation for life in the world, right? 
Type six is called the loyalist uh, or the guardian. The guardian because they're the guardian for the rules and the loyalist because they will give you, you will get the benefit of the doubt maybe 1% of the time. But once you have their loyalty, you have it for life. And uh, they are, I, they usually live in code yellow all the time. I, that's like the best way to describe them. I, I have so many friends who are sixes and I love them dearly and I trust them every time they ring the alarm. Is it convenient for me? No. They are the type of friends though that will say, hey, I think something is off with this person. I don't know if I trust their intentions. I feel a little concerned about X, Y, and Z. And they're the people that contingency think and their core fear is fear itself. Their core fear is that anything that could go wrong could go wrong. And if I don't have a plan or a preparation, I'm doomed. And so are you. How scary is that? <laughs> it is scary. And as as a, as a seven, in, you have the ability, we're going to go into that in a sec, but you have the ability to reach in and borrow inspiration from the six. So no doubt that's something that feels a little bit like, like it resonates, right? The type seven is called the epicure or the enthusiast. I love the enthusiast. I think that is the best of all of the types. I think that's the best nickname. Um, I love them. I feel like I could cry talking about them. <laughs> They're, they are so fun. They're like the beautiful, happiest child of the family of the Enneagram types. They are just filled with joy and just this youthful enthusiasm and excitement for life. This this it, They're just incredible, quick, quick thinking people. And like you had said before, something about sevens is whether it's conversation, vacations, projects, tasks, important or unimportant things. They like to go, jump, think, do one thing right after the other. Sometimes in the middle of some, the last thing they're doing, want to think about or do the next thing because they equate being stuck in one place to emotionally being stuck in one place. And if we can, you know, the core fear of the seven is to uh, is being trapped in emotional pain, sadness, or boredom. And while that doesn't sound like, oh, well, who doesn't, who wants to be trapped in those things? Sometimes for the seven, it can feel like even tapping into that could mean I, I'll, I'll get stuck here forever. I know I will. And so I'd rather not. The type eight is called the challenger or the contrarian. Um, and I like both of these, but I think they both speak to one really important thing in the eight, and that's their need to be against. They have big personalities. Like you can feel their personalities when they walk into a room. Uh, I, they're the personality, you know, the the bull in a china shop, like, you know, you have an opinion, but I have a fact kind of thing. But their core fear which when people hear it, they they get less of a bad rap, right? Because they're typically the aggressive ones tend to get the bad rap on the personality typing all the time. Um, when people hear the core fear and they realize that their fear is being blindsided or at the mercy of injustice, and that's what makes them so protective of themselves, because that's what being defensive is, is being protective of yourself and protective of others. They're like, oh, that, that actually kind of makes sense. That makes, I don't blame them. Um, and for the eight, you will see it's more important to not come off weak than it is to actually be like, I'm strong. I'm the strongest. It's more like, no, I'm not weak and you can't mess with me. Mm -hmm. I'm not small. I'm living with one of those. Yes. Ah. Oh, mm. Must be fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tell you better off, off, off the line. <laughs> All right. I was hopefully they have this swing. Type mm. nine, peacemaker. <laughs> Type nine, peacemaker or referee. I think referee is a good one depending on the subtypes, but peacemaker is the best. Um, they are really, really warm people. They can be a little bit withdrawn, but like really care about people, very empathetic. They can be great listeners, really great mediators. Um, they like to go with the flow. They're fairly easygoing. They don't seem like they have a lot of opinions, even if they do. Um, but one of their core fears is conflict. And while we don't all like conflict or maybe some of us are willing or unwilling to engage in it, Tension, conflict, separation, um, any rift between myself and another, that's that's already in the conflict category for me and I'm going to do my best to avoid it. And so as a nine, the way that the nines avoid it is by melding with everybody, going along to get along. Um, and that's what they do. That's how they protect themselves. And so if you, if you think back, like if you listen back to all of the nine types, their core motivations and what they do, why they do, um, you see that. Every single one of us, you're probably like, oh my God, that sounds like my mom. That sounds like my sister. Every one of us is has like software running in the background that says you need to be protected from this. Like there's software running in the background of my head that needs to be managed that says you need to be protected from being tolerated and not loved. And you have to earn your spot in these people's lives, right? And so I have to work hard to manage that. But there's a why behind everything. So and that's the nine. So the nine is really the... Uh, we. Uh 
we have nine sometimes at work and they do frustrate my eight very much um, yeah. <laughs> because there is that. They move at different carry. speeds. There are different speeds. There are really different speeds yes. in life. And so much of this, when you go through it, it resonates with the MBTI to a certain degree because my type in that is really similar um, what I learned from it, but but it doesn't go, you know, those things don't go into the stressed out and, you know, how, what's our greatest fear. They were the fascinating things for me to look at because my daughter is myself and we've had some huge discussions around this. Um, so, so, yes, yeah, so when people are listening, there's something else important about this is the wings on either side. Um and I don't know whether we have time to, to talk about wings, um, but it, we've got at least five minutes. We, we, I can always we, briefly go yeah, into it. I can, we, just, I can briefly go into anything. Let's wing <laughs> past the wing, shall we? So, Heck yeah. <laughs> let's start. Off you go. What? Okay, off I go. Yeah. So wings essentially, long story short, think of a bird. There's the body and then there's the wings on each side that balance it out and help it fly and glide. Okay, so... A bird does fly better with both wings, but can fly with one. With that being said, you have your main type. And that's the thing that even if all of your actions don't align, even if you're like, I don't know if my personality, if your core motivations line up, that's your type, right? And that's going to be the standard for everything you do. But the way you do it out loud, your personality, your characteristics, the inspiration you borrow throughout, you might borrow it from the number on your left or the number on your right. So to give an example, the Enneagram is like a clock with nine at the top, so myself being a two, I borrow sometimes from the one, sometimes from the three, but I have a fairly even um, uh, dominance in both of my wings. I've met people who really are just their type and like don't even have a lot of existence within their wings or some people who are like, no, like my personality type is three wing four period. Like they can't even say it's just a three, it's three wing four period. And I'm like, all right, I got you. So essentially it's borrowing inspiration on how you do or how you execute. So in combination the with the two, that one wing, the performer, the perfectionist, like I have a certain way that I'd like to do things. Lana spelled backwards. Okay. That's how I am. Then there is the three wing and I borrow and I'm like, I'm going to show off to everybody. And I'd like to admit that I don't borrow from that wing, but I do. But my core motivation does not change. And that is, I want to earn being loved by people, you know? And so it's very, very interesting, but that's the long story, a long uh, and short story. I know that sometimes we, when people do online tests, which I'm not a huge fan of, um, they might get a runner-up type. So they might type as a six, but runner-up would be like a two. Um, and they might go, oh, I'm a six-wing two. You're not. It's just, the, it's, it's just a runner-up score because that's what online tests do. And um, you can only borrow that inspiration from the number to the left or to the right of your number. Yep. So I'm with you. Let's talk about online testing and and uh, you know people reading up on their personalities. And the same goes with the MBTI instrument as such. You know, is that people will often come to my workshops and say, "Oh, they're a certain type," and at the end of it, they go, "Actually, I'm not." You know. So the same goes with what you're talking about. Is that reading it doesn't always relate back to talking about it to a person who's a specialist in it. And so, how do you feel about that? So I will say, I think online tests have gotten better. They certainly have. Um, I believe always, always, always taking an online test comes in second to meeting with somebody. But I know that that's financially not available for everybody. Some people don't learn be- uh, learn best that way. So I very much understand that. I will say even the best paid tests are 60 to 80 percent accurate. They've gotten better. And that's and that's really, really great. And it, it just it takes a certain level of self-awareness, the right test and there's just nobody across the table to say, why did you stutter when you answered that question? Or why, do you, why did you shift in your seat? You look a little nervous. Do you have a different idea of what I mean when I ask that question? Like there's different cues that that per- – like the test can't look for those different things. And some of those have been some of the most important parts in typing people, the difference between – like I'll never forget the difference between a two, like typing a two and typing uh, a type eight, and all of the like all signs were leading to to type two, and I just remember going like, "You don't look like you don't look well. You don't look like you don't look easy. Like you don't look like you're at ease here." And we started going into it, and she's like, "I, I just don't feel like anger's super available to me. I don't I'm, I don't get angry out loud." I'm like, "But do you get angry? 
She's like, I get really angry. I get really angry. I was like, let's talk about that for a second. When you get really, really angry, what do you want to do? I want to retaliate. I'm like, ah, interesting. So it it's really like your online test can't do that. It can tell you your type. Like I love, like I don't know if you took an online test, but it can tell you your type. It can deliver a hopefully accurate information to you. Um, there's no now what. There's there's no is there more. There's no there's nothing. There's just information. And so when I did my um, Myers Briggs and I, I came out uh, ENFJ, I remember taking that information, and all I've done with that in the last. 15 years is answer the question, do you know your Myers-Briggs? Yeah, ENFJ. And then I walk the other way. I've never taken it like that. And that's really my stance on, I did the same thing with on, most online quizzes like I do with Buzz, BuzzFeed's What Pasta Are You? Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, I'm a rotini. Great. And then you walk the other way and yeah. you, nothing changes yes. in your life. Yeah. So I think working with, the Enneagram is something that you can choose, once you learn about yourself in a certain way, you can choose to look the other way, but you can't say you didn't know. And if you're that person that can't and refuses to say, I don't know this about myself, and you're like, I, I, I need to work with someone, you have to work with a practitioner um, versus just your online tools. Uh, excuse me, I don't want to say you have to. It's really in your best interest to work with someone who knows what to look for. You know? I, I agree. Because the thing is, like you say, the depth of it and who's to know? Like I often talk to introverts and extroverts and extroverts have to, uh, introverts have to extrovert. And a lot of the time they're really great. And it just depends on where they get their energy from. But that, that's not described on an online test to that degree or anything like that. So I agree with you. I, I think the depth of it and investigating somebody and to have someone to talk to about how do you balance yourself, you know. You, it's all about balance and bringing yourself, your, to me always, your greatest strengths are also your greatest weaknesses, you know, when you look at the, all of that. And so bringing that all back into balance often requires a conversation around it. And so what to find out about our own Enneagram, you were saying that you had a special offer for the people that are listening. So do you want to tell us what, what that is? Yes, of course. So um, if anyone is listening to this podcast, um, I am willing to give 50% off my typing sessions just because I believe in the value of 100% believe in the value of it. And so we answer the big questions about you in 90 minutes. Who, what, why, how, and what's next? Cool. That would be so, wonderful. Uh, yeah, that would be, I, I'd love to yep. do that. So we'll have a link for that in our show notes. And what length of time, um, when we put it out, what length of time is it available for afterwards? Until the new year. Okay. Oh, cool. Really yeah. great. Oh, that's yes. that's fabulous. Okay. <laughs> I like to do I like to yep. do a lot of like yep. the sales for like a whole yep. quarter. So yep. I feel like it's worth it. All right. Yeah. That's wonderful. What a great chance for everyone. And next time we meet up, Jackie, we're going to be talking about parenting and the Enneagram. Yes. And that should be good fun. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Jackie can help you use your innate personality to create your absolute dream life and fully enjoy your human experiences as yourself in a way that speaks your language and demystifies self-awareness. Find your Enneagram type and harness your core motivation and intrinsic nature to understand yourself, your intentions and more realistic goals, starting now. Using this framework and other personality tools will have you well on the way to a life of self-understanding and happiness. I'm Kate Mason. Thank you for listening to Parenting and Personalities. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and a review that would help others learn about this podcast. If you're interested in discovering more about you and your family's personality types, you'll find my book, Who Is This Monster or Treasure in My House, on Booktopia or Amazon. If you have an episode idea, please send a note to thepersonalitycoach at gmail.com. Many thanks to our producers at Stories and Strategies, and we'll see you next time. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.